Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Aristides Gionis. I'm from KTH, Royal Institution, Institute of Technology in Sweden. I'm one of the program chairs of the conference and today I have the pleasure to host our second keynote of the conference. So as my co-chair Elena Simper discussed yesterday in the opening ceremony, machine learning and AI are making a strong mark in this year web conference. And this is only natural as machine learning and AI are transforming our society and economy. And the web is on the forefront of these disruptions. At the same time, using artificial intelligence is bringing significant ethical challenges in trust, fairness, and privacy, among others. So today's keynote is uh, on the topic of ethics in AI, so a topic of great interest. And it is an honor to have today with us Professor Virginia Dignum. So Professor Dignum is Professor of Responsible AI in Umeå University in Sweden, and she's associated with uh, TU Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, she's the director of the Wallenberg Program of Humanities and Society for AI, Autonomous Systems and Software. She's a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences and the fellow of, artificial, of European Artificial Intelligence Association. Uh, I would like to make a reminder that uh, you can ask questions to our speaker uh, by using your Q&A button on Zoom. And with no further ado, uh, let us welcome Virginia. Thank you very much, Aris. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, thank you, the organization, for inviting me to speak today. It's my pleasure, and I hope that we'll have a, a nice discussion and uh, interactive uh, question part. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm starting my eyes. Starting the slides from the end. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Let me go to the beginning where we should start. Let's try again. Good. So I would like to talk to you today, and I hope that we'll have an, uh, a nice interactive discussion in the Q&A part about the concept of responsible artificial intelligence and what it is, why do we care about responsibility in AI, and how uh, different initiatives are moving from the idea of ethical principles and uh, high-level recommendations to a more practical way of dealing with all this type of of societal, ethical, and human concerns that we all are seeing being um, associated with AI. But to do that, and I have been working the last decade, more or less, a lot with the policymakers, with the uh, politicians, with the um, uh, developers, but also with the procurers, the users themselves, the society in general, and the understanding that people around us have about what is AI is in a sense also an uh, important uh, informing uh, characteristic for the way that we are working and dealing with responsibility and ethics in AI. So I would like to start the, question, the, the talk by asking ourselves, what is AI? And of course, I'm not doubting your, uh, your understanding of what AI is, but I want to share with you a bit what is kind of the conceptualization that uh, people around us, and especially those that are developing these uh, recommendations, these principles and so on, have somehow about what AI is. And what best way to start than doing a web search? We are in the web conference after all. So if we ask the web what AI is, we get this type of answers. And it will tell us that AI is blue and uh, that's being seemingly being the common characteristic of AI. I didn't understood that one yet. I will probably, some research has been, needs to be done about why AI should be blue. But what is important to realize from, like I say, from the overall perspective of what people tend to understand that AI is, 
it, it is related with the idea that AI is an entity. It is not unusual to hear people talking about the AI or an AI that did this or did that. So there is this idea that we can separate the, the AI system from the environment where it is, that there is some kind of encapsulation between this is AI, this is not AI, and we can address the AI components uh, specifically. There is also, of course, the idea that AI is some kind of agent, has some kind of capabilities of acting in our world, and we know that that is true in many cases. So AI is an active, is an agent, is an active entity, and uh, will uh, autonomously or not take uh, actions that affect many of us. There is also very much this idea that. A, there is an user which could interact direct, uh, more or less directly with AI. AI will talk to someone through Alexa or other types of uh, uh, assistance. AI will deal with the, the de determines for you whether recommends you uh, films, determines whether or not you get credit and so on. So there is this idea that AI is associated with users. And at the same time, of course, there is the idea that AI is data, data is AI, that there is no difference in many, in many discourses, many narratives between AI and data. All these are partially true, but in other hand, when we talk about responsibility, we really need to go further than just these usual conceptions of AI. All these conceptions and all this, the, the, the public discourse on AI is also very much based in the idea that we acknowledge that there are problems, that there are concerns, that there are issues, but the belief is that there will be a technological fix for all those ill effects. Uh, as we work in AI in my group and many other groups across the world, from a multidisciplinary perspective, from the idea that AI is more, uh, at least in, the, in its use and in the narrative that we see, is more than just the software and computational components. It is uh, increasingly clear that there is not just only this technology fix. We really need to do much more than fixing or improving our software components. So we all know that AI is not intelligence, is not intelligence in the way that we would call a person intelligent. We know uh, very well that uh, what AI can do very well, and at this moment, a lot of what AI really can do is uh, related to pattern matching, to uh, machine learning, to deep, uh, deep learning algorithms. So AI can identify increasingly well patterns in data, extrapolate from those patterns to new data, take actions based on those patterns. But we also know that there is a lot still that AI systems cannot do. And those are things which we uh, uh, traditionally expect that are uh, uh, part of human intelligence. Things like common sense reasoning, things like learning from very few examples, being able to generalize from, from, what, from examples into more general concepts, combining learning and reasoning. Those are all issues that, uh, which we all are doing a lot of research, but still are not in, uh, incorporated in most of the AI solutions that the general public uh, has uh, experience with. And because of this, it is also extremely easy or extremely um, possible to lead AI systems to do things or to believe things which are not true, just by changing the, the angle of the, the, the bus, the school bus in the picture, or by putting stickers on a stop sign, we can easily confuse an AI system, exactly because this, the idea of the concept, the, the context, the meaning of which this, the system is operating is often lacking from the capabilities that the system has to understand. So AI is not intelligence. Uh, also learning from data is definitely not magic. And this is a slide that I use in many uh, presentations for uh, a less technical uh, public than you, but it's clear for all of you that how AI works. Basically, uh, if we look at AI algorithms, are not, not magic, definitely not magic. What comes and the complexity, the, the capabilities of AI comes of course from the complexity and the huge, the sheer size and complexity of the 
networks that we can make, but still uh, pattern matching is different from understanding. Intelligence is more than correlation and many of these systems, like you know, work with correlation. And if we see an algorithm as a, rec a recipe, we also know that when we use recipes, the result, the cake of the, the algorithm, the, the apple pie algorithm, the cake is more than the recipe. So we, we do know that it's not magic, but the, the the, the type of uh, techniques, the type of approaches that we currently are using with AI come with some uh, complexities. So AI learning from data comes with some problems. Uh, we all know about issues about bias and discrimination, the lack of uh, data in uh, about specific groups or specific contexts can very easily and get an, uh, can guarantee that we will get results that are biased, that are potentially prejudicial to several groups. So this is a, a, pro a problem well known to all of us. We also know that uh, AI results tend to be quite brittle and you can easily uh, confuse the AI system to do all kinds of uh, strange uh, things and uh, take the decisions just by changing one or two uh, uh, pixels in these pictures, uh, the, the decision or the, the diagnosis is com completely different. So we do know that it's easy to, to attack or to make errors. And it's very brittle, especially outside of the training environment. Uh, there are issues about how are we developing these systems, how, uh, what are the methodologies by which are developing these systems, can we guarantee that we structurally approach the, the way systems are learning, the way we are dealing with data, do we know what is the quality of the data that we are using, can we really vouch for that quality of that data, so there is a lot of problems around the, the data driven AI systems that we are most using at this moment. And of course, if we decide to use this type of systems in many different situations, and we do are using these systems, we people, we the ones who take those decisions, the ones who develop these systems, the ones who uh, procure these systems, the ones who manage these systems, we people are responsible for the potential problems that are developed or are generated by the use of the systems. We are aware that what we are using is not always uh, clear, not always uh, understandable, and we, don't, we are aware as well that the data that we are using is not always or definitely, guaranteedly never 100% correct and complete. So there is a lot of examples and a lot of issues in which we are, AI can be seen as irresponsible, so not the responsible AI that I want to talk, but really this uh, ways and there are many ways to use AI irresponsibly but that's not what the talk is about so let's continue and try to, to understand more about responsible AI. So AI is not just algorithm, it's not just the data, it's definitely not magic. We know that AI is not intelligent. There is also a bit of discussion on whether AI is or not artificial. And many of you probably have read the book by Kate Crawford, The Atlas of AI, in which she exposes in many different ways the lack of artificiality of AI systems. What we do know is that AI systems are constructed and they are, in a sense, inseparable from the people and the context, the environment which in which they are developed and by which they are developed. We also know that AI applications, AI systems are not alone. They are part of a social technical ecosystem, including all those that one way or another have a stake or um, a say about this type of systems. And we also all know that there is no technological fix to all the ill effects of using AI. So the concerns, and there are many concerns, and the areas, uh, when he introduced me, talked about issues of privacy, of bias, of uh, security, and so on. And those are the basic, the day-to-day -day concerns that we all are trying to solve. I think that this type of concerns can be um, classified in three main types of uh, topics. In one is the issue of datification. We know that we, ourselves, our world, our environment is more than the data that we have. We also know that the data is always a representation of reality, is never the reality itself. We also know that data is always about the past. We don't have, by definition, data about the future. 
And we also are seeing increasingly that the availability of data can be seen as a metric for decision making or a metric for success. When we have data available, we see that there is a possibility to develop systems that can deal with that data, that can take decisions and act on that data. When there is not data available about a specific group, a specific area, a specific region, those type of problems are kind of left behind. So we really need to understand the, the role of data and the role of the ability, availability of the data, the role of the way that data is, what data is constructed and collected and so on, that that is for, uh, forming our understanding of the problems and the, the, the complexity of our world. This is very much related with the issue of power. Who is developing AI? Why those uh, in power are the, those that have power to develop AI are uh, developing those systems? Who is deciding? Is really leading forward the direction in which these systems are being used? And we do know that a lot of the power at this moment is placed in private organizations. The the big the the the, the, the big tech organizations, which are not necessarily, also by definition, aligned with democratic principles. They are uh, private companies led by their own uh, stakeholders, their, their own shareholders, and their own uh, commercial and uh, um, uh, enterprise motivations. So we do need to understand as well that the power of developing AI is also shaping the way AI is developed and is um, impacting our societies. Another issue which increasingly comes uh, uh, more and more into the discussion is the issue of the cost, cost of AI. Are we, as we are striving for better and better AI systems, more and more accurate AI systems, are we taking sufficiently into account the, the cost, uh, societal and environmental cost of that improvement? Can we justify a 1% increase in uh, accuracy if that takes 50% more computational power? These are discussions that we are not having sufficiently and which uh, I believe that will be shaping the way AI is going to be developed in the future. We really need to have a balance to understand how uh, benefits and costs need to be uh, con uh, con um, accounted for. So responsible AI starts with many are calling the question zero. The question of, yes, we know that AI can potentially do a lot. Should we applying AI technology in this specific question, in this specific issue that we are, uh, that we are dealing with? The ones who decide about this, the values and the priorities that they make for those values are determining the way the AI systems are developed. So if we don't enough take the time to think about, should we be using AI? Are, are there other options? What are the, the pros and the cons for using an AI uh, technology for a specific question? Who is deciding? Who is involved? Uh, do we have sufficiently uh, broad uh, participation of all of those that uh, are potentially affected by the systems. How are we prioritize uh, values, uh, sustainability and accuracy? I just uh, talked about those. Uh, uh, privacy versus security. How are we prioritizing these things? Really are leading the way that AI is being developed. So responsible AI is in a very short uh, definition about asking these questions and demanding the answer to these questions. It's about thinking which decisions do we want AI systems to make and when. Do we want AI systems to deal and to help us making deal with our motives, our aims, our ambitions? Or do we want AI systems that like a GPS system just tell us a plan for achieving a goal that we set ourselves? Are we wanting AI systems that are beneficial and uh, supporting me as the individual user? Or are we looking at systems that are benefiting the society in general or a group in specific? The, the benefits for me, individual benefits and societal benefits are like we all know, often not aligned. How are we dealing with the 
notion and understanding that what a society accepts and what is ethically acceptable, what is legally allowed, are often not, al not aligned. And we do need to uh, navigate this complex this, uh, space, a space which changes with time, changes with context. We all, all as we uh, take decisions in our lives, uh, we have changed our ethics and the justification for what we do as we go. We know that we cannot have it all, that we have to make choice. So how are we taking this, that issues that for us already as people are extremely difficult, how are we looking at those and describing and um, de um, dealing with these issues as we are developing AI systems? So responsible AI, there is a lot of work being done. It's about ensuring that AI systems are aligned with the rule of law, are uh, uh, ethical and aligned with human rights and societal principles, but also about ensuring that, that the AI technology, the AI uh, uh, software is re reliable, is robust, does what it's expected to do, does what the box says that it does. It's beneficial and also, uh, Important, very important to realize that we need to be able, we as computer scientists, as engineers, need to be able to have the means, the tools, the, the process to verify all of the above. How do we verify the lawfulness of a system? How we verify the ethical alignment of a system? Those are uh, very specific, very uh, co uh, concrete questions that we as uh, computer scientists really need to start uh, thinking about. And those are questions that we typically as engineers don't really have the answers and therefore we do need to look at it from a much broader uh, multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, responsible AI also recognizes that the AI systems are artifacts, that we set the purpose for the designing of these artifacts and of course systems will learn, will adapt, will evolve and whatever else, but uh, at the end of the day they were designed and they are designed by, by us, by people with all the motivations and all the constraints that I uh, described, we are setting the purpose. So responsibility is also about our own responsibility. So let's start with the principle side of it. My talk is about from principles to action or to practice. There is a lot of work done at international level, at national level, both in public and in private organizations, defining what are the principles and the guidelines that should guide the design, the, the, the development, design, and use of AI systems in a way that it's aligned to it. Uh, human uh, rights with the democratic principles, with what we people would want these systems to be. So there is at this moment, I think, no, hardly any organization, international organization in the world, which has not come yet with uh, a set of principles, a set of guidelines and so on. Uh, there are more than 200 of this type of documents uh, by many different, uh, divide, designed by many different uh, organizations for many different purposes with many different backgrounds and so on. Uh, the, maybe the UNESCO and the OECD are the, the two uh, main ones which really try to be as broad uh, uh, in encompassing of as mo uh, many more different countries as possible, but th there are many. What we can learn from all this is first that yes, there is a huge interest and use com a huge commitment from all these organizations to come forward, to make their stake, make their uh, uh, position, take their position in the quest to responsibility and trust, trustworthiness in use and development of AI systems. So they all are committed to it for, by many different ways. At the same time, we can see that all these type of documents are written first, mostly by non-technical people. And a lot of what is there is sometimes surprising for us as uh, engineers, because it shows this uh, blue uh, the idea that AI is blue and magic and I don't know what without sometimes much understanding of what the, really the concrete systems are. But the documents are, are written and uh, describe AI at a very high level of abstraction. Uh, they talk about uh, robustness, safety, transparency, accountability, and so on, in many cases without really making a very specific um, 
definition of what we mean by this system with these terms, which makes it in one end easy to, uh, to compare and to see that all of them, they are not so different from each other. They can be, be written by many different organizations, but at this high level, they are quite comparable. And the, the, we just uh, show there a, a, a small example of how, how comparable they are. But what makes it complex, especially from the perspective of practitioners, of us that are developing these systems that are uh, doing research in AI area, is that it's extremely difficult to translate what this uh, document says into some very concrete requirements and um, uh, guidance to the way that we are uh, developing and uh, designing these systems. It is easy to say that we want the system to be fair. It's extremely difficult to understand how are we going to implement fairness. So how do we understand fairness and what does it mean uh, when we are down to the designing of the code of the AI systems? Uh, that's part of the work that we are doing at my research group. So because there are so many, we also have to start to really be able to, uh, to question these documents and to understand which of them really might be relevant for the, the purpose that uh, a developer or a policymaker or an organization has. So there is also a lot of work talking about how are we going to compare this, this, uh, this guidance documents? What can we do about the, the different, um, the, how to compare and to to select between one or another. So this is just a sort of uh, examples of questions that we can ask, we developers, we uh, um, the, the ones who are deciding to use or to develop a, an, a, an AI system and want to make that aligned with the, the guidance documents. Uh, and it, it gets, gets increasingly more complex. But at the same time, uh, regulation or uh, these guidance documents are, like I say, very uh, high level of abstraction. There is quite a lot of work outside of the, the development, the, the computer, this computer science and engineering work that we, uh, many of us are doing outside of our disciplines. There is a lot of work being done in trying to operationalize the, the guidance that is received. Uh, examples are, of course, uh, efforts in regulation in designing laws that will enforce and get, guide the use of AI. Uh, and the uh, most known example is the AI Act uh, proposed by the European Union at this moment being discussed at the European Parliament and hopefully going to uh, implementation by the member states uh, by, towards the end of this year, maybe. It proposes a human-centered approach to AI, proposes a risk-based approach. To, uh, the idea is basically to, um, to determine our risk of the potential risks of uh, the technology and the area of application. And based on this uh, evaluation of the risks, uh, there is more or less um, uh, requirements that are going to be put on the systems. At the same time, there is a lot of work done on standards and IEEE and ISO are doing a lot of work on that. Uh, standards in this area, st standards for responsib responsible AI, standards for trustworthy AI are of course, like many other standards, soft governance, they are not mandatory to follow, but at, uh, by following and by contributing to these standards, we see that organizations are really having this desire of demonstrated due diligence, also limit the liability by guaranteeing that what they are doing is aligned with the standards. They can uh, also uh, provide a user-friendly or a, a computationally friendly integration between different products, which also motivates a lot of organizations to work on that, to work on the and uh, adhere to standards. Uh, many, especially very large uh, enterprises in the world or uh, organizations in the world, are coming up with internal efforts to uh, regulate, to uh, to. Uh, to design and to uh, analyze the, their own internal um, uh, work, uh, advisory panels, ethics officers, AI ethics officers, and so on, are increasingly uh, being um, 
being installed in many organizations. Of course, the new the media will show and tell you all about what goes goes wrong with this type of panels and this type of work, uh, including issues around the ethics washing. But in many cases, they really are doing quite uh, good work and beneficial work in the industries in which they are being implemented. In many cases, even in some organizations, projects and the, uh, deliverables and services cannot be uh, approved before the ethical uh, advisory uh, board or the ethics officers really um, agree that that is the designed and developed aligned with their own uh, standards and uh, requirements for trustworthiness and responsibility. There is also a lot of work being done in the assessment of AI systems, providing uh, all kinds of tools and methods and uh, evaluation criteria to determine how how aligned and how, uh, how, how ethical, if you want, how responsible, how trustworthy your approach to the AI, to the to uh, to the to these uh, guidelines and principles are as you are developing AI systems. Uh, of course, it's important to realize that responsible AI is much more than ticking boxes. It needs to be an attitude through the whole process. But at the same time, this type of approaches, this type of tools and metrics, are really uh, helping uh, organizations measuring their maturity and the capability of their systems. And of course, nothing of this can be done without also efforts on education and training to really uh, and provide a minimum understanding of what is AI, what are the potential concerns and problems, and how can those be addressed. So let's go see a little bit of how it is the taking the responsibility on AI to practice. And in here, I will refer to quite a lot of the work that we are doing in my research group. So responsible AI, if we go back to this idea that AI is a social technical system, which encompasses between other uh, computational uh, components that uh, in one way or another are uh, have some level of autonomy, some level of adaptability and interaction, all these uh, standard uh, definitions or characteristics of AI systems. So if we take this social technical uh, approach to understanding that the system, the, the software itself is never alone and is always part of a bigger, uh, bigger scope. Then talking about responsible AI is talking about what we call art. It's talking about ensuring that as the system is autonomous, as, as we are providing autonomy to computational components, we do need to design the mechanisms for responsibility in this social technical system doesn't necessarily need to be designed in the software, but we do need to provide mechanisms for responsibility, either in an organizational a business or a software a way. The same way as we are divine, designing systems that are adaptable, that change, that learn, that uh, evolve, we do need to provide transparency about why and when and what for this learning is uh, meant. And of course, if systems are interacting with users, with people, with the, the environment, we need to provide accountability for the consequence of this interaction, both in terms of explaining, uh, providing account of what's happening, but also uh, the capability to take the blame in case that things go wrong. So uh, the uh, accountability, responsibility, transparency is what we call the art of a, a responsible AI. Art, uh, in this sense, is mostly and for a large part about being explicit, about creating explicit ways to understand and to uh, identify which high-level values are relevant and important in a certain situation. How are we interpreting these values into rules and norms that then later on are concretized in the functionalities of the system? So this, this methodology, which is often known as the design for values methodology or the value sensitive design methodology, methodologies really shows that the legal, ethical, and societal aspects cannot be done as an add-on after we have developed our software, then we are going to somehow provide some 
societal or ethical south over, uh, over what we have done. Now it needs really to be taken from the beginning and incorporating in every step of the design, every step of the behavior of the systems. It's about the regulation and providing the means for external monitoring, for control, for auditing, providing issues in terms of agreements, contracts, norms, which uh, will guarantee that uh, art is taken into, um, into account and as we are, uh, if you look at it from a perspective of design, it's about what where I start with the, the questions here, asking why are we doing this, what could we have done different, and what who, who, has, it, who has been involved in the choices, what have motivated the choice, and what other types of options have been there. So taking responsibility is about not only the by design, the privacy by design, the ethics by design, the legal by design, which most, mostly refers to the behavior, the results of the system, but we also need to look at taking responsibility in or during the design process, really making sure that the processes that are used to develop, design, maintain, uh, deploy, uh, and the use the AI systems are in themselves as a process uh, aligned with the responsible and the ethical concerns. And the, for a large part is also taking responsibility for the design of this system. So it's about our own stakeholders, the human responsibility in all of this. In our group here at Umeo, we are working in many of these things, but mostly we are looking at formal verification of systems, formal verification of these high level concepts. How can we move them into uh, practical uh, tools for verifying that systems are indeed adhering to the, to the principles? We are looking at work on assessment and monitoring. We are also providing developing tools for uh, simulation to support policy setting and policy analysis. And we are also working uh, increasing, uh, for, for a big part also in uh, awareness and uh, knowledge transfer and uh, collaboration and uh, education activities. So if we talk about this form of verification, what are the basis for the work that we are doing are two main realizations. One is that black boxes in whatever uh, way we look at them are not always to be avoided. And these are not necessarily only the, let's say the algorithmic black boxes, but also organizational black boxes, or even people can be seen as a black box. So we cannot avoid the use of black box systems, either by property, uh, concern, security, the complexity of the systems. There are many cases in which we are using systems or components that we don't really understand how they work, but still we need to be able to trust these systems and we need to be able to guarantee compliance of these systems against our values. So that's one of the, uh, the realizations, one of the, the the basic premise for the work that we are doing. The other one is the so-called alignment problem. Uh, values are described by definition, by necessity, at quite high level and are usually very uh, abstract. They are also the, dependent on the context and they will have different interpretations and different results depending on the context and the culture. So we really need at the same time to be able to be explicit and contextual on the choices that we are making. If we look about work that has been doing in uh, transparency and algorithmic transparency and explanation, often is very much about the choices that have been made, the result of those choices, and not so much about this all contextual uh, environment in which those choices uh, where it took place. So it needs to be broader than the work that is often done at level of algorithmic transparency. So we are taking this into, uh, into uh, as a basis for what we're doing, the design for responsibility, in ways that we can evaluate this, uh, the, this interpretation, to can measure uh, different options and different possibilities, and we can implement them. 
This all starts with a large part of the work about the discussion, a participatory approach to the uh, how to interpret, how to select the values, how to interpret these values, how to concretize these values. We have done this together with the city of Rotterdam. We have done it together with uh, colleagues at Delft, with UNICEF. We have developed uh, in many different ways uh, methods to support the participatory uh, interpretation and, uh, and uh, elicitation of values and how to concretize this this work. Uh, at this, also, it's important to realize that the decisions that are making in this uh, in this hierarchy in this model really matter. So, if you take the concept of safety as a value while you are trying to design, uh, let's say, a self-driving car, uh, you can interpret safety in many different ways in terms of uh, rules to limit speed, in the rules to ensure crashworthiness, many other ones, and you can again implement these uh, these rules in many different ways. And as we uh, take these decisions, we really need to be aware that the decision that we take in the way that we interpret and concretize the, the, the values are affecting the end result of the system. And it's important to make many of these decisions are not always made in an explicit way. They are also not always made by the, those that really have the ability to take, uh, to have a broader understanding of what the consequences of the decision are. So there is also a lot of organizational and uh, process work needs to be done to really ensure that within an organization, the awareness about the, the, the importance of the decisions and the explicitness of these decisions to be made. So we are looking at the ways to govern this and to evaluate and to verify this glass box, the use of glass box, both by querying the glass boxes about what kind of results, uh, what if situations are possible, but also in a ways that we can control what goes in and out of the black box to guarantee that independently for what the glass the black box is doing, we can guarantee that what goes in and out is aligned with the principles that we want. Uh, we are doing uh, some, I, I don't have here the, the not the plan to provide the, the computational and the, the formal background of this, but I just give some of the desiderata for the, the work that we are doing in terms of what do we want to achieve and how we want to uh, build this uh, formal verification of ethical principles in terms they need to be uh, domain agnostic, needs to be context aware, needs to be, of course, computationally tractable and so on. So there, there is a lot of work done in the group and also in other groups, of course, on this area. It's also important as, as part of this characteristic to realize that if we are taking the, this idea of looking at the black box uh, without necessarily needing or being possible to open it up, and this is of course uh, aligned on extending existing work on, uh, on uh, transparency and on opening of uh, the, the, the computational black box, we want to do this in a way that it's independent of so the, the verification of the system can be done in a way that it's independent from the, the internal design of the system, also independent from the types of interactions, the types of approach, the types of uh, uh, context in which the system is being used and potentially also independent from the types of audits, the types of monitoring that you want to, uh, achieve, to uh, provide on that system. Uh, in terms of the assessment and monitoring, we are also developing a uh, whole uh, system for with the, the RAIN system, the Responsible AI no, no Networking System, which really provides support for assessment and monitoring. We are being, doing this in the context of a small startup, uh, which has been facilitated by the Knut and Ellis Wallenberg Foundation here in uh, Sweden. And it basically, uh, we developed a large ontology of many of these concepts which helps us uh, assess and design, the, the, the ter setting up what types of uh, criteria, what types of uh, policies, what types of um, uh, concerns there are for a specific system or product, and then be able to uh, reproduce, to, uh, to analyze the, the current situation at the different stages of uh, development. 
So finally, and to, fin to finish my uh, presentation in a way that we can still have some time for questions, bas the, the basic idea, the basic message is the responsible AI is a concern of all of us, is a multidisciplinary concern, it's something which we cannot do uh, solely from an engineering or computational perspective, we really need to integrate the understanding from all types of other disciplines that will support us understanding, critiquing, critiquing, criticizing the intended and, uh, and unforeseen uh, consequences of using AI in terms of equality, in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights. So it's kinds of questions, fundamental uh, human questions for which we do need a multidisciplinary approach to address and also to support the design and the analysis and the use of AI systems. Uh, Innovation, uh, 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 responsibility and ethics is not a uh, constraint on innovation. Innovation, firstly, is not is really about moving technology forward. It's not about the right, like many tend to understand innovation as being the, the right to use technology as it is now and let us use all these uh, capabilities for uh, deep learning, for uh, all the tools that are there and use it as, as they are in all types of uh, areas and contexts. If we really take innovation seriously, it's really about moving technology, moving science forward and uh, what best can we have uh, in to help us identifying in which direction we want to move forward then the the work that is being done and the guidance that is being given by regulations by ethics and so on so in a sense we do, do need to understand regulation responsibility and ethics as a stepping stone for innovation doing all what we can do now in a way that is aligned with human rights democratic principles and ethical values so by doing this we really can support uh, public acceptance, we can drive the transformation of uh, technology of business and so on, and we can provide business with uh, ways for differentiation. So it's really important to see and to understand the possibilities and the potential of uh, ethics, the potential of responsibility, the potential of regulation to support our efforts to move our science and our technology forward. So AI can do a lot. We do need to use it in a responsible way. It all starts with this question zero. Should we use AI? What type of AI system should we be using here? And who is deciding it? It's definitely not a magic issue. The AI applications are artifacts made by people and we set the purpose. And like we all know, do know, all know AI can give us all types of answers, support us identifying answers in extremely complex uh, uh, fields and areas, but if we are not asking the right questions, we probably don't really get the right answers. Thank you. And I think we have now time for questions. I'm not really sure. Yes, how thank this you. Works. Thank you, Virginia. This was this was very thought provoking. A nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I would like to invite the audience now to ask their questions. So as we said before, there is a Q&A button in Zoom. Um, so yeah, please. So meanwhile, we already have one question by mm -hmm. Rafael. Yeah, I see uh, it, yeah, so yeah. Me, yeah, okay, so, um, so let me read it. So. Uh, for the academics who are teaching uh, technical courses or are responsible for graduate programs, uh, what should be the role in education, the future generation of engineers for these programs? How can they be supported? What material exists? Uh, how do you move from the idea of educating an engineering student with ethics to practice? So it's kind of very... Uh, hands-on yeah. question how we are moving forward yeah a lot of, a lot a lot of questions and a lot of very important issues thank you rafael for the question uh, starting from the the materials yes there is quite a lot of work and uh, developing uh, ethical uh, 
materials for ethical education of engineers. There are a couple of European projects this, this moment really specifically developed that. There are work also in many other, uh, in, in United States and many other areas, really developing courses and curricula and content for that. Uh, I can give you some of the links to those things, but I don't have them at hand, but uh, feel please uh, ask me an email and I can provide you some links. What is indeed, I think the most important is to make uh, engineering students understand that ethics, learning ethics is not doing ethics. And any uh, philosophy student knows, uh, knows that, that by, by learning about ethics doesn't really necessarily make you a more ethical person than those that don't learn ethics. What is important for engineering students is to realize that it's more an attitude that you have to take do, towards the whole engineering process than a kind of a checklist that you can use at the end of your project. So it's, it needs to be integrated um, uh, seamless, seamlessly with all the education that students are doing. I don't really believe uh, much that giving a course on ethics somewhere in the engineering uh, uh, curriculum really will make a big difference, but uh, providing this, uh, these methodologies and tools and the process uh, uh, approach for uh, integrating ethics in all the other disciplines that students are doing. I think that that's a much more useful, uh, useful way of uh, going forward. Okay, thank you, Virginia. So we have commenting... the next question. <laughs> yeah, can you comment on the upcoming EU AI Act, specifically high risk definition? <laughs> uh, I can, I don't know how much time you <laughs> <laughs> so first thing for those who don't really know about the upcoming AI Act, uh, the European Union has provided this draft uh, roughly one year ago uh, on a proposal for a regulation of AI systems, which, which divides these systems into uh, different types of um, of, uh, sorry, how you call it, uh, different uh, risk levels. And for each of those risk levels, the systems are uh, uh, considered. I'm, I'm, I have here, I'm just showing another slide that maybe helps uh, with this understanding. Oops, where I can go there. So this is basically what AI, uh, the um, AI Act of the European Union looks like. It aims at the protection of health, security, and human rights, and at the same time ensuring the advancement of innovation. What I just said at the, at the end of my talk, uh, looking at the, uh, regulation as a stepping stone for uh, for uh, innovation, uh, the, those uh, ones which are um, those systems which are of really unacceptable impact are uh, systems which uh, are will go, will going to be forbidden, and there are in the act proposals of those ones which are going to be forbidden. But the most relevant ones are these high impact, high risk systems, which can be identified, and they have identified that in the in the AI. I act by uh, listing a uh, whole area of topics which are considered of uh, of high risk uh, biometric identification education and training is also a potential area of high risk and what they expect from uh, what we do when a system is identifying as high risk is um, what I call proper software engineering is demanding from those that are developing and using these risks, all kinds of uh, certificates and uh, uh, information about how it, the, the risk management of the system is going to be done, how the data governance is going to be done, providing technical documentation, providing logs of usage, providing transparency and information, indicating how human oversight is going to be done, how it is uh, providing issues about accuracy and proofs of accuracy, robustness, and cyberpunk. As an engineer, I see this very much as just 
following some proper software engineering methods. Uh, but that is not really clear yet at this moment exactly what they are going to demand. It's also not like the Irish AI systems are going to be forbidden, but they are going to be subject to more uh, regulation or more uh, effort than uh, in terms of evidence than other ones. But the, the whole discussion is still in the, in the European Parliament, so things might change between now and then. Okay, very good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, our next question is, uh, in a recent book, Eric Smith and Henrik expressed the concern that AI is becoming a geopolitical issue, a new weapon. Do you believe this? And how can we or you or our community address the issue? Um... AI is a technology, and like we know, any technology can be used for good or for bad. We people are extremely good at finding ways to use technology for bad, to really misusing the technology. So in a sense, yes, AI can be used as a, as a, a weapon, in a, and I'm not talking about autonomous weapons, but really as a weapon in a ge geopolitical conflicts. Uh, probably it's used already. It's probably being used for uh, distributing uh, mis misinformation and other issues, especially concerning at the moment the Ukrainian war. We know that AI has been used also to influence uh, elections and so on. So we people have, uh, unfortunately, a high cap capability of using technology that we have for bed. We build hammers to help us construct houses, and then we can use those hammers to uh, beat someone in the head so it's um, it's up to us to to design it to this to define and to uh, through education through uh, awareness through uh, through dialogue it is a uh, ways that we have to to make sure that things are not going to be used so much in that way but it's not um it's not um, an issue which only concerns AI systems. It's something that, unfortunately, we people do with any other systems. Of course, the community is uh, concerned about that, and a lot of work on, like I say, on awareness, on uh, education is being done to make people aware, all of, especially engineers aware of the possible dual use of the technology that we are using, and appealing and creating. Um, a sense of own responsibility in all of us. But uh, yeah, it's not, not specific to, to AI. Okay, thank you. So I have one question uh, by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you said, responsible AI is not about ticking boxes, but, uh, and, but then you uh, propose uh, many different requirements. Uh, but for some of those, uh, like accountability, fairness, transparency, we don't have the answer of what does it mean. And so this is, uh, in many ways, yeah. an ongoing research topic. Yeah. yeah. It might be yeah. difficult to develop universally accepted uh, notions of what does it mean for yeah. an AI algorithm to be accountable or transparent. And we, it might take a long time. So my question is, uh, what should they do? What, uh, how we move forward with um, imprecise definitions? So, yeah. So our approach there is to make exactly the the whole uh, 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 hierarchy of concepts explicit, and uh, I make explicit uh, how do you interpret uh, uh, fairness in the system that you are building. Why do you interpret fairness as equity or as equality or as something else? Is uh, it, it leads to definitely different designs, different results. Uh, but you might you, you. What is important is that it's clear how what have you uh, how do you understand uh, fairness and hopefully make that understanding of the, the concept. Uh, the, uh, uh, that they reach to that understanding in a participatory way, so involving all of those that uh, might have a stake on the system and in a participatory way, uh, identify which values 
are important in this system, fairness, safety, sustainability. What do we mean by these things? Do we agree on these uh, definitions? How are we going to in interpret these definitions? So if you make this process explicit, you at least have a justification and um, um, a way to measure and to evaluate the results of your system. Those are the kind of things which we are doing. We are not determine a specific definition for fairness, for instance, but we are providing the tools to fix your own definition of fairness, which we mm. uh, expect to be uh, accepted within the context of the use of your system, and then measuring the results of your system against that definition. Okay. And indeed, I, I do agree with you that there is, uh, it's impossible to uh, even later to get really consensus about all of these things we have been mm -hmm. uh, at, uh, doing ethics for more than 5,000 years and no one really came yet with those definitions. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that it's something which we probably not should not even attempt to. I think the, this answers also very nicely the next question I had, which is by Elena. Uh, which is um, that uh, ethics is not uh, there is no it's not a globally universal no. accepted notion. So no. there, there are geopolitical issues. Depend there is context in different countries, uh, yes, and definitely. there might be tensions uh, between. Yes. Uh, no, yeah. And one, but if one, I, it's a very important question, and indeed ethics is something which each one of us is free to adhere to your own ethics as a person, as a country, as a region, and so on. One thing in this area, which maybe I should refer and which is a worrying concern at this moment, there is especially, I was part of the discussions of the UNESCO, recom UNESCO recommendations, and there, there was a big push by some countries to use the concept of ethics in the document instead of the concept concept of human rights. And that is, in a sense, quite worrying, because human rights is something which is uh, legal, uh, there is legal consequences, and there is a legal definition of the human rights and the, the ways to deal with the, the human rights law. Uh, if we move away from demanding that AI systems are aligning with the human rights and start talking about AI systems being aligned with ethics. We are opening a potential door to everybody to decide whatever you want the system to be aligned with and just say, sorry, that is the ethics that I are there for. So there is also this political push and discussion about uh, being precise in what do we really want the, the recommendations to be about. And the, the consensus is that we should really push for uh, human rights and the democratic rule of law, uh, rather than a more soft and vague uh, discourse on ethics. Okay, thank you, Virginia. So here- Thank you very much, and it was my pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, uh, it was, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for attending and enjoy the rest of the conference.